Greetings and salutations all you folks out there. I've got a little bit shorter of a game for you today. It's like 22 minutes, I think. And it's between some top level players on Hotbox. This is going to be a three versus three. So like I said, a little bit smaller than normal, but I think we can get some good times out of this game. Should be a spammy one because we've got a lot of open ground in the middle here. Um, quick note before I start that, actually two very quick notes. Number one, on this Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern United States time, GMT minus 5, and again, I say that because of our lovely comrades over in Europe who are uh, far away from the American time. Um, we're going to be doing a stream that is going to be benefiting Doctors Without Borders. That is a worldwide charity that anybody can give to and know that your money is going to help people in a lot of different places. So it's something that I think will appeal to everybody, not just Americans who typically would be watching the stream at that time. If you can be there, 6 p.m. Eastern United States time, uh, GMT minus 5, I would love to have you. Our goal for... The fundraiser is 500 bucks, and I am matching 10% up to that 500. So, if you and the people that you invite can get us up to the goal of 500 bucks, you will be taking 50 bucks out of my pocket and putting it towards that goal. So, good things happening there. The other announcement is I really need some replays. I have a lot of replays that have been sent in to me, but unfortunately, it's just not stuff that I can cast. I think I've had four games sent to me in the last week that were an hour and a half plus, and that is simply too much for me to do unless it's extraordinarily exceptional circumstances. Quick qualifications for sending me a replay. Number one, the best way to send it to me is attached to an email, the actual file attached to an email sent to the email address in the description. And please check it for desyncs before you send it to me. Uh, number two, it needs to be between about 20 minutes and about an hour, hour and 10, 15 tops uh, in the game time. And please don't let it be a steamroll. Steamrolls are okay once in a while if it's a facepalm game or if it's some kind of example of a good strategy, something we can learn from. But Face palms, or not face palms, steamrolls as a whole are not that fun to watch. So please stay away from those. But if you have any games that fit in those other qualifications, then absolutely send me replays. I desperately need some to have some material to cast for next week. Alrighty guys, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this game. As I said, it is higher rank players, uh, 1500 to 2100. Obfuscation is on the south team. He is the 2100 high end of the rank. He is taking UEF, then we've got UD, UEF as well, and Soul Ripper AU. He is going Cyber and the odd one out there. And he is a 1500. On the north side, we've got two 1800s. We've got Invictus taking UEF and Deshu Keki, Kaki, whatever. I, I always fail at the pronunciations on these names. I do believe that that is Hero Protagonist. So we're going to call him Hero for this game. And then we've got Zero in the middle. He is Cybern. So double Cybern UEF, double UEF, Cybern on the south team. No love for Aeon or Seraphim. The hippies and the aliens are out of it in this particular instance. Let's go ahead and check the early build orders. I spy a lot of manual reclaim. We've got rocks being reclaimed there, grabbing a mass extractor, a couple of trees. Looks like uh, it's mostly trees on this map. There are a few rocks here and there scattered amongst the trees, but for the most part, it's not anything too huge. Actually, we can do this glorious little thing here where we press... Why is my shift G not working? Apparently it is not wanting to show reclaim. Either that or all of the reclaim is too tiny to show up, which proves the point that I was trying to make. There's not much reclaim on this map. Looks like we've got first land and then three, count them, three air factories for Soul Ripper. So he is going to be the air support player this game apparently. Trust his teammates to overkill the land spam. Then we've got first land, second air for both of the other players, and then a third land factory planned by Bloodier in the back there. So 
this is going to be an interesting start because there's so much air on the south side. I'm interested to see if they get spammed into oblivion by the north side. We have first land, second air for Deshukaki, otherwise known as hero protagonist. Then we've got a land and an air for Ciro as well. And the same thing for Invictus, although Invictus is getting a huge head start shoving his commander into the middle of the map. I'm not entirely sure why everybody's pushing their ACU out though. Maybe it's Habit. Maybe it's Maybelline. I don't know. It, it seems odd to me to be rushing the commander way out into the middle of nowhere when there is not mass as an incentive. It seems like it would make slightly more sense to use the build power back in base, but then again, I guess if you're going for map control, there are several mass extractors out here in the mid and your ACU will help um, control land forces in the middle. Uh, by itself, ACU is roughly, roughly equal to about 20 T1 tanks, depending on your micro. Um, and then paired with an assisting ground force, it is a tremendously useful tool. So you just kind of have to balance out the... You have to make the argument with yourself, is it more useful for my ACU to be building things or to be moving to the front and engaging in combat? And for most of these guys, I think the answer is forward position. Invictus is going to stop and build factories though. So he's gonna have his build power close to the front end. He's got tanks coming out. I do like obfuscation, pushing these units to the side. He's going for denial over here. There is an expansioneer on the right for Invictus, and that is probably going to get pinned down by these tanks. Nope, it is not. He is going for building wall sections. That is an interesting move, wall sections this early in the game, although I guess, I guess if he does get it down before the tanks get there, that will effectively stop them completely. I spy, with my little eye, a Jester, and that Jester has been scouted by Soul Ripper. And again, Soul Ripper is the guy with a hell of an air build, and actually that air build has been canceled. He's only got two factories planned and one of them much later. So not as much overkill as I thought there was originally. He, There is a distinct air advantage for the south side, though. I see a T1 bomber. I see two, three, four interceptors total for the north side, and on the south side we have four, eight, nine, ten, yeah, about a dozen. So huge air advantage for the south. These tanks moving up, they were going to try to slip by, but a combination of three tanks and a jester is going to be more than enough to shove those things back where they came from. Um, that engineer does look like it's going to get its wall sections down. There is a pass. There's access through the back. So if you're able to run around the outside edge, you can nail those two extractors and get around into the back of the base, which is basically what you want to accomplish on any good solid run by. There is going to be a mass extractor going down there, but uh, he is so close to the build power and that ACU that I imagine those will get wiped out very, very quickly. Here comes an ACU, Bloodier moving way, way up. He is well past the halfway point on this map and getting his ACU all up in this build power. If he can lock these factories down with his ACU, keep them from pouring out units and possibly take out a little build power, it will serve him very, very nicely. But I think this point defense is going to force him to withdraw or at least keep him from getting too close because uh, this early in the game, we're sitting at the five minute mark, he does have overcharge available. That is actually mildly surprising, but he doesn't have much power. So whatever he burns an overcharge on, he's only gonna get one, unless his teammates decide to gift him some extra power. All right, backing off just a little bit. So that is going to be the end of that push. Over on the left, we're seeing a little bit of the opposites. White is pushing down. Hero is getting an upper hand on Soul Ripper. And uh, so basically the entire map is rotating counterclockwise just a bit with the middle holding exactly on the halfway mark. Yudi is getting an upgrade. That's going to be T2. Going to get that on his commander and hopefully, well, I don't know. I'm saying hopefully. He is going to get a T2 point defense creep going. I can feel it in my bones because that's the only reason you get a T2 UAF ACU. Okay, maybe not the only reason, but it's pretty dang common. I'm not sure how this will work on this map though because uh, there is already a T2 HQ up here, which means Viper spam is moments away for the Cybern player. Although there is a little bit of a problem with T1 spam here. We've got a lot of units for UD, far more than Red has. Red with that early T2 factory up there is a little bit short 
on mobile combat units. Actually, on stationary as well. Not a single point defense in between this group and his base. Prime target for runbys if that were a thing that could happen. But um, once those T2 units start flowing in, he should be fine. He's got T2 Engineer, a Rhino, and more Rhinos coming. So he should be able to do just fine momentarily. Upgrade going down. That is a gun upgrade for Hero. He is shedding a little bit of health. He is in the middle of a group of enemy units, but now he has the gun upgrade. Question is, can he get himself out of this situation? Because at the moment, he is taking horrendous amounts of gunfire. Not entirely sure. The question is uh, more accurately, can he vet up before he gets to critical health levels and then he'll actually have a chance. At the moment, he's around 2,300 health. He is at 16 vet. There are enough units around his ACU to vet up, I think. There's one, yes. Okay, so 2,300 health with an extra bit of regen. Looks like UD has noticed what's going on and he is going to push all of his units over to the left. Red as well. So now we've got four units, or four players units involved in this calamity going down over here because this is looking more and more like a mutual KO the farther I go on. 800 health versus 19, yup. Wait for it, wait for it. There we go. <laughs> Embracing each other in a nice warm nuclear hug. That is gonna wipe out the entire left side of the map. I'm not even gonna hate on that decision to go for the mutual KO because the Cyber and Gun Commander is a terrible thing to deny when you do not have any upgrades yourself. So honestly, an unupgraded, unestablished player, mutual KO'd an upgraded player with a little bit of, of extra uh, units at his disposal for map control. Well, those units got killed off, I shouldn't say that. I don't know, it's an even trade one way or the other. I always hate it when uh, mutual KO happens super early in the game because basically that means we end up with Turtle. Um, we're going to get engineers claiming all of this stuff, getting a little bit of reclaim that they can, a lockdown happening on this left side, and now we're going to have an eco player who can just sit there and tech up mexes. Maybe we'll see some T3 land, but we do have that T2 commander, and it is a gun com, so very tough bastard to kill. He will be able to hold his own versus the red ACU, which is completely and totally unupgraded. We've got gun upgrade on Invictus. He is going to engage all of these tanks on the right-hand side. Bloodier's units obviously going to retreat because you don't want to waste your units on a commander that you have no chance of killing. All you're going to do is vet him up and feed him reclaim. No use in that at all. Invictus has his wall sections over here. He's got plenty of units on the map to control this entire area. He is doing absolutely fine for himself. UD taking the lead in the score, and I think that should be, it should be abundantly clear why he has taken the lead. He is going to be the eco powerhouse for the southern side. On the north side, looks like things are being split up a bit more evenly. Invictus taking a few mass extractors here and there, and Ciro taking a handful, actually the greater majority, I should say. Um, but that's going to be split up between two players. We'll just have to see how that works as this goes on. Five Mantis moving towards the back of the base. Doesn't sound like much. A raiding party of five, but when there's not a whole lot here to defend, they may kill some of that valuable build power. There is a pillar moving in, so it should be able to deny all that without much of a problem. Looks like the gun com is working reasonably well for Invictus. He does have a shield gen with him. Always a handy dandy thing to have, and he has enough power to run it, also a good thing. He is going to be able to tear up that artillery and advance his position just a little bit. I wouldn't say that Obfuscation is in a bad place, Bladeer is doing pretty dang well for himself. He's getting a T2 upgrade, which is almost complete, so he should be able to deny pretty much anything that Invictus is able to throw at him. I spy a T1 transport. What is that there for? These guys are already building flapjacks and vipers in anticipation of point defense going down. I say that. Actually, they're not a bad unit to have on hand in any situation. I had a cast just a little while back where uh, someone was using a single mobile missile launcher basically as a T1 artillery 
T1 mobile artillery in the T2 phase. They would progress just far enough for that mobile missile launcher to reach out and kill a mass extractor, and he was just being a royal pain in the buttocks with that one single mobile missile launcher. So this is not a bad unit to have around at all, at all. It gives you a lot of standoff range where you're able to deal a little damage, just be a thorn in the side of your opponent as you force him to move around and dodge those shots. Quite annoying to deal with. That T2 commander is going to fall back a little bit. There's several T2 tanks, about six, seven pillars up there on the front, which is no small force. You're going to have to overcharge several times to get rid of all that, and it's going to deal quite a bit of damage. There are plenty of units at Bloodier's back, but they are all T1. He's going to try to get a T1 point defense down. Let's see what his economy situation is sitting at. Not the greatest. Uh, probably stalling out quite a bit trying to build that point defense. Not going to be able to get it down very fast at all. Those T2 tanks holding back just a little bit obviously do not want to get in reach of that commander because the overcharge is strong when you start getting next to the ACU. Point defense going down very, very quickly. That is going to be able to deal out some damage, but there's T1 mobile artillery and that mobile missile launcher. Hey, you're useful. I'm going to take down that point defense in no time flat. Take a check in on the bases, see what's going on. We got a T2 Air Factory, which is starting to build Corsairs. I smell an ACU snipe. We've got T2 in the back, and then it looks like we've got a T3 ground factory upgrade going. That land factory, well, I don't know. He has the eco for it. He finished the T2 HQ upgrade, and now he's going for the T2 land sitting on 60 mass per tick. There's a little bit of a mass stall, but he does have those extra mechs, so I don't know. Maybe he'll be okay with it. I've always said, and I fail to do it in my cast, sometimes I feel bad, because I'm like, you know what? Do as I say, not as I do. But the results speak for themselves when you execute it correctly. Basically, you need to do one thing with all of your mass, and not three or four things, and that almost always works out better. Obviously, you need a little air, you need some land, and sometimes you need some navy. But you don't want to go for tech in all three or two of them at the same time, and you don't want a hardcore eco while you try to hardcore spam unless you're Zoc, because then you have infinite manual reclaim orders and it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you basically want to put all of your APM into one strategy and overwhelm the enemy with that tool while trying to cover your other bases as best you can. That's a Corsair firing at the ACU. Only one, not that dangerous. The question is, how many are there yet to come? We've got two Corsairs down. At this point, I, if I were Bloodier, I would be stockpiling mobile flak because uh, Corsairs make me tremendously nervous. Bloodier is actually at the bottom of the scoreboard at the moment. And the intel is not so good on the north side. And let's see, UD is on the top of the scoreboard because obviously he is eco whoring. This is not going to be pretty. He doesn't have any combat units really in the back side, so when all those T2 units drop, this is all going to go away. It's going to be a nasty, nasty problem to deal with. Zero backing up a fair bit there. Got T2 gunships on this side. UD has taken the T2 factory upgrade as well. And Bloodier is sitting on his T2 HQ and a bunch of T2 support factories. Getting those pillars rolling fast versus Invictus because Invictus has got the established T2 force. Although in that short amount of time, I think Bloodier has pretty much caught up. T2 gunships and Corsairs. It is Snipe City up in here if uh, anybody chooses to do this thing. So pillars have dropped a little bit far away. We do have Medusas in, which are going to get one volley off on that mass extractor and then die horribly painful deaths. I am kind of disappointed that none of the shots connected with the Stingers, but you know what? It is what it is. We'll take what we can get. All six of those going down. Kind of a waste. The least they could do is kill one single mass extractor. The amount of damage that T2 gunships can put out is deceptively high. Really, truly is. There's the T3 land. We've got Loyalists on the field, which are going to be able to deal with T2 quite effectively. I think 
they can actually kite it. There's the range on the T2, or the uh, Loyalist, and there's the range on the Pillar. So it's close. I think the Loyalist, well, no, it's, it's about the same. Whatever that case may be, more damage and more health, obviously. You're packing a ton of damage potential into a small area with the T3. So it should be able to ram right through the heart of any T2 swarm like a spear. Triad's going down in an extremely forward position. I have no idea what Bloodier was thinking on that one. That uh, point defense basically insta-dying. And we have a lot of Corsairs out. Was that a run? That was not a run at the ACU. What did you get? The TMD? Probably the TMD. There's what we've all been waiting for. Corsairs striking out at Bloatier's Com, taking it down to about two-thirds health in one pass. Luckily, he has a ton of interceptors, which are being kind of badly managed at the moment behind his ACU, going down to 5,000 health one-third health and below that even to 4,000 with those Corsairs passing yet again. He can't quite reach out far enough to kill that Loyalist without stepping back and he does not want to run into a potentially dangerous situation with his ACU. 2,000 health as that Corsair continues to pass and then Loyalist giving him great pains. Unfortunately, the ACU focus fire is going to let those things go down although he damn near killed that commander down to 800 health. Although now it does look like it's relatively safe. Here come the Corsairs again. Mobile Flak shredding Bloatier's Interceptor Force. Highly unfortunate that those flew out over that area. Why are you not building a T2 shield gen? That would be so useful. Greatly extend the lifespan of your commander. More Medusas dropped. Zero taking advantage of the mayhem to drop some units back in that base. That's going to force Bloatier to push some T3 units over in that direction. ACU continuing to run away up to 2,000 health. So actually not looking too terrible. This is far from over, I think. He does have a chance to get something back together. Those gunships, they are gone either to flak or to interceptor force. Oh, that is a spearhead. And multiple T2 fighter bombers coming in. UD is getting in on the party trying to shoot down those Corsairs. So those are friendly. Perhaps he was saving up. No! Saving up for a snipe of his own. Dang it. Obfuscation finally going down. That is the worst way to die. The long, drawn out death process where you just can't get what you need online to stop the death. Ugh. I didn't think you would make more because you had no chance of killing me. <laughs> 10 out of 10 logic. 10 out of 10 logic. Let's read this. I should not have died to those. But I didn't think you would make more because you had no chance of killing me. If I had made mobile shield, that's just retarded move from you. Wow. So the logic here is that you have no chance of killing me with fighter bombers. Therefore, I will automatically assume that you will not build more of them and I will take no precautions against them. So the, the rock, paper, scissors with logic here is basically... If I take any preventative measure, this won't succeed. The other person is going to assume that I will take preventative measures and it won't succeed. Therefore, he will not build the thing that will kill me. Therefore, I will not build the preventative measure. That is a loop and one that is very dangerous to slip into. Alrighty guys, hopefully you enjoyed that. Like I said, a little bit shorter of a game this time around, showing you a critical error in logic. I am not ripping on Bloatier too extensively because I have made more than my fair share of slips in the thought process while playing this game, but hopefully this is a cautionary tale to all of us. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please do not forget to tune in to the charity stream on Saturday and to send me some replays, and I will see you guys in the next one.